So can I now just introduce you to Peter, who is our the, the, the keynote speaker today. And Peter will have a conversation with you, give you the benefit of his experience, and then we'll all get together for some questions and answers. So without any further ado, I'll pass over to Peter. Thank you. Thanks, Phil. So hello, I'm, I'm Peter Proud. Uh, I started for it in 2014. So uh, the average age for a founder starts up in the tech world is actually 45. So I did it a year before I was 44. So I felt a bit of a youngster. Everyone seems to think that startups are for kids. Uh, it's not quite the case. Uh, so, you know, life began, began for me at 44. Uh, the, the journey that we went on to start a company, I was a, I was a corporate boy. Um, I worked for Microsoft for 17 and a half years and I worked for, um, for Accenture for two and a half years. I actually did uh, 15 years at Microsoft. I went to Accenture for two and a half and then I felt I should go back to Microsoft again after two and a half years at Accenture. So you can read into that what you want um, just to get myself kind of whole again. But um, uh, this, this meeting started our journey uh, onto um, starting our company. Uh, this was 2006 and um, this is uh, the leadership team of Unilever. And in 2006, Unilever uh, marketing and Unilever technology didn't actually uh, speak to each other. And um, we, I spoke to both. And uh, so the, the CIO asked if I could help facilitate a meeting with the heads of marketing because marketing and Unilever spent about a billion a year on technology out with the control of the CIO. Uh, so, so we were quite lucky because we, we had Bill work for us at the time. And everyone else thought he was the richest man in the world. And I, I actually thought he was a sales tool. So we were able to use him to uh, get customers in a room. So we, we got billed to do a, a, a session on the connected consumer. Uh, in, the, in this meeting, um, his time is quite difficult to get hold of. And, uh, and, and we had him for an hour. And the meeting ran for about two and a half hours. And I had his business manager ping me the whole time saying, get him back, get him back. And he said, I'll decide. Um, and, and we spoke about the connected consumer. And within this meeting, we ended up running things like Axe, Dove, Lynx um, on the Microsoft MSN infrastructure. Uh, this, this was totally out with my group. I, I worked for Enterprise and Partner Group, so we sold all the traditional Microsoft stuff. Um, but we brought in the kind of online gaming Xbox. So, for instance, uh, we, we showed them Xbox Live in-game advertising. We ended up buying a company called Massive, so we could start to put advertising and say games. So things like Zoo Tycoon. And we were able to put Magnum uh, ice cream vendor machines inside of the game. And if people put the vendor machines into the game, then they could get a voucher from Unilever to go and get Magnums or Lipton's tea. Um, we started doing analytics and data for them, following the sun from Sydney to uh, Seattle. So for instance, the Real Women campaign, the target audience was affluent non-working women affluent non-working women. There's no one in that demographic here because if you're here, you're kind of either working, you know. Um, so there's no one in that demographic. Um, but they were looking for people that didn't work to actually run this advert too. Um, and, um, and so we, we ran the advert on MSN before it went live on TV globally between 9.30 and 11.30 in the morning from Sydney to Seattle because affluent non-working women used the web at that time. And we did a survey to change the, the actual... Um, the, the, uh, TV advert that was being published by Seven Seconds because it, the, the feedback we got from the 180,000 surveys told a different story to what they were wanting. And, you know, we, we didn't really understand that world very well. But actually, if you were going to be doing a survey globally to get 180,000 surveys, it would normally take about two years and we did it in three days. So this was the kind of meeting we had. Um, and, and we ended up going from doing nothing in this world to about 30 or 40 million of revenue in nine months with, with one customer. And I was dragged out of my job to, to put together one Microsoft, which was a case of um, how, uh, um, how we could take this, you know, the our consumer con connection, because Microsoft touched about a billion and a half consumers every day. How do we take that model and those consumers to the enterprise customers? So that's what we did. And we ended up building a billion, billion dollar business. So talk about, Ellen was talking about entrepreneurialism inside of big organizations. This was a good example of it because we built a billion dollar company within the company without actually building any more new products. We actually just took the consumer connections we had to enterprise. So that, that, that was what we did. And, and I got taken out my job that I had um, to, to run one Microsoft and basically I got 89 product teams in one room. 
uh, we came up with the idea. And, and actually in a company like Microsoft to get 89 different product teams in one room is very, very difficult to do. I got escalated more in three months than I had done in the previous 14 years. Um, and the, um, the, 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 the whole idea was to understand what everyone had to then start to tie together all the products. So as part of that uh, discussion, we came up with the idea of a marketing stack. So we saw where all the products sat. We had an infrastructure layer, a services layer, a data layer, a content creation layer, a distribution channel, and then we could build a portal to manage it all. So we thought this is a great idea. We should build this inside Microsoft. It, it just wasn't part of the strategy. So we took it to Accenture. Uh, Accenture said we'd build it. So I left Microsoft to go to Accenture to build it. And then eventually Accenture said, we're a services company, not a software company. You should be part of a software company. So we went back to Microsoft. I tried to get Microsoft to build it again. They, um, they still didn't want to build it. So we took it to WPP, so Martin Sorrell and his company at the time. So we started building it with WPP and I realized I was back at Accenture again with a software business inside a services company. So we just went, look, can we buy you out? And that's how we started our company. So we had the idea in Microsoft. We started building with Accenture. We went back to Microsoft and tried again. We went to WPP. We realized we had to do this on our own and, and, and keep on going. So, so the first lesson I would say to everybody is tenacity is very important when it comes to starting a business. You know, just keep on going. Uh, the other thing that happened in this meeting was quite funny. Balmer, um, Balmer was our CEO at Microsoft at the time. Gates went back up to tell Balmer about the meeting, said how good it was. And Steve Balmer, secretary, got in touch saying, can you see Steve, Steve wants to see you. Uh, he wants your notes. I was like, all right, okay, that's right. So the guy uh, here, Alan Lockhart, was my architect. And I said, Alan, uh, can I get your notes? Because uh, I hadn't taken any. Um, Balmer wants to see me uh, with, with our notes. And uh, he, he didn't take any either. So, you know, when you're going up to see the CEO of Microsoft to kind of give the notes to a meeting that you've not taken any notes to, you can get yourself in trouble. So the second lesson is make sure you've got good relationships with your customers. So um, this guy here, Chris Turner, was in charge of IT. And uh, this guy here, Lou DeComo, was in charge of the market and stuff. So we got them in a room and said, right, give us your notes. So um, the Unilever guys uh, gave us their notes and we gave them to our CEO. So the other lesson is make sure you take notes, right? Nice and simple, right? So... Um, and, and anyone knows me well, I talk about this a lot. So, so I talk about crawl, walk, run. You know, so if you think about building a company and getting a product to market, uh, crawl is when you're burning money. Um, so that's when you're defining, you're designing, you're building, and you're testing out your idea. So you, you, you're starting to, you're spending money at this point. You're losing cash, right? Walk is when you get the first bits of business. You get your commercial model right. You're starting to speak to your initial, and this is all about honing and getting fit for, for scale. You know, so you, you're still, you want to try and neutralize the losses as you're going through this phase. This is all about getting yourself fit for scale, getting yourself fit for purpose, fit for, so if you get things wrong at this stage, it doesn't sink you. So one of the things that, and, and which was kind of weird for us because, you know, I came from more of the commercial side than the technical side. Um, when we got our first customer and they actually said to us, how much? We were like, that's actually quite a good question. We hadn't actually, we'd been so excited and spent all our time and energy building the product. We actually hadn't put as much effort and energy into the commercial model. So we actually just stuck our finger in the air and came up with a figure which was wrong um, to their advantage, not to ours. So, you know, we, 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 lost, we lost business. We never, we never lost business, but we, we, we didn't make as much money as what we could have made from that. But then again, you know, one of the things to think about when you're building a company, I always think of every deal having three currencies, which is PR feedback and cash. You know, so when you're doing the early deals with customers and it's a new product, you want to get PR, you want to get feedback and you want to get cash. So you always think about that because the, the, the feedback makes your product better. Uh, the PR obviously makes it easier to sell and the cash actually keeps your lights on. So, you know, during this phase of, of, of crawl, you know, this is, you, you just got to get the foot down, right? Everything takes longer than you think it's going to take, it costs you more money than you think it's going to cost you. So the quicker you can start to get to paying customers, the better. Doesn't matter how much, how much investment you've got in the world, the more you get, the more you spend. So I'm very careful with investment, right? I try not to take, we've, we've only raised uh, 1 million since we started this business and we've grown it from, from just, just myself to 57 people just on 1 million investment. And we've probably spent about a total of 23, 24 million. So because, and we've been able to do that because we actually got to paying customers relatively quickly. So I call it the dash for cash, right? So the quicker you can get money and the quicker you get money in, the better for everybody. So, so crawl is, you've got, to, you've got to define what you want to build. You've then got to design it. You've got to build it and test it. Then you go into the kind of walk, which is all about getting yourself fit and, and just getting the commercial model, the marketing, the customers, the PR, the staff, everything right, and then run and scale. So scale the business and keep on innovating.
The next thing is really to understand your product. You know, why, why, why are you even doing something? And, and you should be very hard on yourself when you, you think about this, right? Because it's like, and one of the things I got all the time was, hey, why are you even trying to do this, right? Because there's kind of big companies in market for, we built a, a, a platform for building big websites. And, and a lot of people um, uh, have said, said to me, why, why are you even doing this? There's, there's, there's market leaders. And I'm like, yeah, but none of them built it for the cloud, right? It's like, they've all built it for on-premise. They've built it for the last generation, right? If we build it from scratch as a greenfield site, straight out of the cloud, we're going to build something better than they can build because they've got their legacy to fix, you know? So, you know, just be very clear on what your purpose is, you know? So the first thing is understand your product. How long is it going to take, right? I thought I was going to be ready about three years ago to do what I'm just about to do. So it's taken us about three years longer than, than what I thought it was going to take. I thought we were going to do it in five. It's taken us about eight, you know, because it's a proper enterprise product, getting ourselves really to scale. So it always takes a lot longer than you think it's going to take. Uh, just one question, right? We've got some Q&A. You want to do the Q&A all as, as, uh, as, as we we'll go through, or do you want to just stop and shout at me and ask me a question? I'll answer it. I'm happy to do either. It's up to you, Eleanor. At the moment, like something. Right, cool. All right, so, so how long is it going to take and you know, how long is it going to be to take to get ready? Uh, the next thing is, you know, start to put conservative estimates together and double it. I mean, for us, it's kind of, that's kind of what's worked out. You know, we've kind of taken twice as long as we thought we were going to take. And, and really think about when you can start bringing in profitable cash. Because if you look at what we've, we've done, we've been able to deliver to our customers the fact that we had a service with some tools and we used the service with the tools to get to product. So we've been very, very, you know, um, uh, focused on, on delivering a great experience to our customers through a hybrid of, of a set of tools and, and, and services. And what we've done is we've used all the learning and all the money from the, the set of tools and services to create a product. So what we're going to have next year is a product that we can really, really scale the market, sell to hundreds and hundreds of customers instead of just a handful that we have today. So that, that, that's the first thing is to really understand your product. The next thing is, you know, you know, thinking about what skills and what you need within your organization to actually build, build that product. So the way we think about the world, and this is something that, you know, I've, I've seen this a lot in, in the techs, I've been in tech 30 years, you know, the first stage is product definition, the next is product architecture, the next is build and test, uh, pre-production and then service delivery. What tends to happen is people are tight for money and they write down the product definition, which is the what. They, uh, they rush into the build because they forget to kind of really think about the how. Uh, they then don't test it enough and then they jump straight to the delivery thinking they've got something and then you start to fail because you've, you've pushed something out too quickly. So, so be very careful when you're taking something to market. And what, what we've done within our organization is make sure we've got owners of each. So the product definition is done by a product board. So we actually have the management team. So everybody's part of that. So everybody's actually bought in. So one of the things you really need to do is make sure you take people on the journey with you. So if you're part of that product definition team and you all agree to it at the start, then it's very difficult halfway down to say, oh, I wasn't bought into that or I don't agree with that. Take people on the journey with you. So the first thing is product definition. So we have a product board where all the managers that sit in each of these different areas sit. And the next is the product architecture. So we have an owner who owns the architecture responsible for the, um, all of the documentation that comes out of the definitions into the architecture, and that's the how. And that's a very important part, and a lot of companies forget to do that. So one thing I would really urge to do is make sure as, you know, not only part of the what we're going to build, it's how you're going to build it, make sure you get that right. Um, go into the build and test, make sure you've got the right teams, the right skills. And one of the things that we've, we've been able to do as is, is we've gone in, gone forward is the people we had early on have grown into their jobs. And then what we're able to do is we've been able to hire more senior people as we go further forward. So just think about the skills you need, the kind of people you need within your organization to make sure you hire the best you can afford. Sometimes you can't afford the kind of very, very, very best in the early stages, right? So what you do is you go and hire the smartest who are junior, right? And then you give them and take them on a journey. So go and hire super fast people. One of the things that we've found um, is that the, um, there is a real shortage of skills in software engineering, software development. And, one of, and, I, would, and I, I go on about this all the time. I want, I want to see more and more girls going into STEM and software engineering, right? Because software engineering is not a bunch of hoodie geekies, right? Sitting in a room at dark at three o'clock in the morning, right? It's a very interactive, very social thing where you've got to work in teams, you know? Um, so what we did to try and get more skills to help us is we put together a graduate apprenticeship program um, and the first uh, graduates just graduated three weeks ago. 
and our apprentices got four firsts and a two one. And of that group, it was three boys and two girls, right? So, you know, and both girls got the first. In fact, one of them got top of year. So, you know, that figure, right? So, you know, it's not about a bunch of geeks sitting with hoodies, banging on a keyboard, right? It's about project management. It's about communication. You know, it's about actually understanding, you know, the fact that writing software is just telling a system what to do, right? That's an interactive thing. There's humans at the end of it. So user experience is important. Understanding product or whatever. There's a whole raft of industries within the IT industry. So, you know, people need to understand what technology is. If you pro build a proper enterprise software, it's not just, it's not about the code, right? The code's actually a relatively easy bit, right? Um, it's about the end-to-end -end process. So, so just think about the skills you need within your organization. Um, and, and, and then that gets on to how you're going to sell it, right? So how is it different? So, so you know, when I think about what we've got, it's cloud-first, cloud-only, headless, CMS, you know, out the out the box, super secure, super scalable, super robust. You know, we did this. We did the launch for Windows and Surface. So when the CEO of Microsoft stood up on stage, we activated the websites worldwide for the launch of those products and took 120 million 120 million hits worldwide. Right. So we 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 know what the USP of our business is, and I think that's really important for people who are starting a business to actually know what the USP is going to be before they build it, instead of working out what it is once you actually get there. Right. So know why and what you're building who your buyers are within the organizations, right? So one of the things that's interesting, and I'll just share my experiences, um, we, we run a bank's website and we had to go through 17 different departments. And the story was the same, but different for everybody. So the CIO, it's all about security, resilience, scalability, robustness. The CMO, it's all about speed to market, creative freedom, you know, analytics, data, uh, localization, the fact that it's accessible. You know, the compliance team, it's all about security and protection of data, blah, 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 right? So we had to go through, so it was the same product underneath, but it was a different story for everybody. So just think who the buyers are and how you're actually going to speak to them and what problems it solves for your customer, right? So we can say instant scale, very easy to localize, blah, 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 right? So just be very, very, I used to use that blah, blah, blah before COP came here. So I used that before, right? So, but um, it, it's, it's, it's all about understanding, you know, what you're building, who you're building it for, how you're going to service it, how you're going to scale it, how you're going to charge for it, you know, how you're going to maintain it and how you actually make it profitable. One of the things I think we're very good at here in, in Scotland is we're very good at ideation. We're not very good at jumping the, the, the bit from ideation over to commercialization, right? I think we're amazing at building products. I don't think we're as good at commercializing the product as we are at building them. And I think we're even worse at selling them because I think we all feel a bit insecure and we're too scared to actually shout. I worked over in the States for a long time. And when I go to the, used to go to the startup type discussions, they were very, very different. And everyone thought they could change the world. You know, you come over here and people are a bit more shy and a bit more reserved. And I think one of the things I would like to see is us just getting a bit more confidence because we have got a lot of skill. We have got a lot of well-educated people and we have got great ideas. We need to actually change that ideation to commercialization. Okay, so the next bit is um, if you need to raise money and, and, and people tend to have to raise money, um, just know your partners, investors, because they, there's a lot of sharks out there and there's a lot of people that, what, what I always kind of try to explain to people whenever uh, they're speaking to investors is that you might have a hundred acre field and the investor only wants two acres where the gate is. Right. So all they care about is controlling what's coming in and out of your company. Right. So just be very careful. Right. They might actually come up and give you a great deal with regards to your investment, but there'll be prefer preferentials that will be tied to that investment. So, for instance, they might say, right, we'll give you I'll use an example, but I won't name the company because this happened to them. Uh, we'll give you one hundred and fifty million pounds of investment, um, but we want a three times return preferential before you get any money. So if you sell your company for four hundred and fifty million, they take the 450 million and you get the air left inside the, the middle of the door ring. So you get nada. So be super careful when you're going into agree, uh, uh, agreements with investors around about preferentials, what the terms are, what they expect out of you, and, and just know what the business model is. Um, uh, are they honest? Are they straight? Are they going to screw you over? Uh, just be super careful. We, we were speaking to an investor who tried to change the terms of the deal the day we were doing the buyout from WPP. So he changed the terms, thinking that he had us over a barrel, and he thought he could change it from an investment to a loan. And we just, I actually just hang up on him, to be honest. And uh, we didn't do a deal with him. And, um, and because if they're going to be tricky at that point, they're always going to be tricky. So if you're actually going into bed with a set of investors, make sure that they care, 
as much as about you and what you're doing and your product as what you do. If the, if the first thing they say is show me your projection, your balance sheet, you should be questioning if they're the right partner for you. So just, just be careful. You're going to have to get investors, right? But just be super careful and cautious with what you're getting into bed with because once you've signed the paperwork, you cannot get out of it. You, you, you are tied in. So just make sure, we, we're lucky now, we, we, we actually did do a deal for the million and we got a great, great partner and he's been nothing but amazing to work with. But I, I speak to lots of people in my position and I, and I really feel for them because they are, they're actually employees within their own business, even though they still have a majority share just because of the preferentials. So don't look as much, just look, look as closely at, right, we're gonna give you a million for 10%. So that's great. But also look at the three times multiplier. This is what you're allowed to do. You've got no, no say over your, um, You've got no. Oh, is everything okay? Uh, you've got no say over your um, over the way you spend your money, your pay rises, or whatever. So just make sure that you're still in control of your business, right? So make. Ah, good. Fine. Right. Yeah. No. Is this me? Do I have to move? Is this what happens? All right. So ah, here we go. Excellent. Right. So good. Oh, that's good. I was actually feeling better in the dark that I should have not moved. <laughs> right. So, um, and then and then what does success look like? You know, for them. Uh, and, and budget and cycles. So, so, you know, when are they going to give you the money? How are they going to release the money to you? And just be very careful with the, the relationship you're going to get in because you, you are probably, if you're starting a business, going to need a partner or an investor. Just be. This is probably one of the biggest, biggest decisions you will make as you're starting a company is to make sure you get that investor right. And, and this happened to us, right? So the person who was going to do a deal with us started as an investment and at the last minute changed it as a loan. So just make sure that you always have a plan B. Just make sure that somebody doesn't have a gun to your head because nine times out of 10, they will pull the trigger. So just be, and, and, and the paranoid survive when it comes to this because you know there are a lot of people there. I don't know if anyone's watched Startup and Netflix, right? That's what happened to them. The, um, the, the people actually uh, did a deal with somebody and he actually stole the company from under their noses. And there are people that try to do that. So just be cautious um, and have good lawyers. And I know it's expensive, but just make sure if there's one thing as you're doing a deal like this, just make sure you do have some good legal representation. And that's one of the things I like about what's happening at Strathclyde, you know, with the kind of startups, you know, using potentially the legal department to actually do deals. And, and one of the things that we've done is we've actually had um, three other startups within our office that came out of another university and they came into my office and we give them access to our lawyers, we give them a nest to succeed, we give them access to their accountants. So when it comes to professional services, make sure you actually use the representation around about you because those legal documents are something. Once you put your, your name to that ink, you cannot get out of them. So just be careful. Sorry, I'm going on about this quite a lot, but if everyone kind of can just get one thing from this is be careful when it comes to your documentation, your legals around about investment and your partners that you're going to go into. Um, are the people that you're going to get into partnership going to give you access to clients or actually going to be a potential obstacle? So when we actually had our joint venture, there were some uh, unlimited liabilities within uh, the company we were part of before we did the buyout. They actually stopped us doing business from some people. And we had put in a lot of effort to do a, a big sales campaign to a big bank, probably eight, nine months worth of work. And then when it came to signing the paperwork, uh, the actual legal team from within the company that we were part of uh, actually blocked that because of the unlimited liabilities that went alongside. And that was okay in the world of TV and print, but when it went into digital, uh, the, the risks were too high. So. If you're going to get into, into a partnership with a company, just make sure and understand what they can bring, but also what they can stop. So, you know, be very, very careful. And then the last couple of things are quite, are quite simple. It's, are they excited about the product as you are? And, 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 and work out if they see you as a long-term bet and investment, or they're just looking to take your company and sell it as quickly as they can. Do you want to take any questions or do you want me to keep on going? Let's, we've got some questions here. Um, so one of the first questions that we have here is from the steps that you're talking about your crow walk, crow walk yeah yeah we can go um i don't think it it, it matters quite as much because this is more about building a product right and a product can be a service but um yeah it, I, I don't think it, it quite as much to content creators but i think that that this is more about building a product yeah so i don't think it does but yeah, it's, this is more about a product, and that product can be either a physical product or a, or a service. Okay, thank you. Am I on now? Yep. Okay. Um, another question from Janice Cunningham. Janice is asking, um, 
founders, inventors, creators often find it hard to sell as they're too close to the product. product. Right. They can be too protective of the product and they can be too technical. What would your response to that be? This is a good, this is a good question, actually, right? So, so if you look at the history of most companies that are super successful, uh, there's normally a pairing. Right. So if you look at Lotus Notes, there was Jimmy Riozzi. If you look at Microsoft, there was Paul and uh, Paul Allen and Bill Gates. If you look at uh, Apple, there was Steve and Steve. You know, so and, and it's quite interesting because actually a, a company, a, a potential company that I think is going to be amazing. And I've actually linked some good meetings up for them that's come out of Strathclyde University. Um, uh, there's a tech person and there's a market and sales person. So the way to get around about that is to make sure that you've actually got a pairing. And, and actually, I'm going to talk about that get going further down, talking about building high-performing teams. Mm -hmm. And if you look at the, the, the very, very successful companies that have started in the last several years, there tends to be a pairing where there's a good front person who's a good sales market and business person, and there's a good um, uh, uh, technical person. If you look at our company, we've got, uh, we've got three. So we've got a very good CTO. We've got myself, who's more kind of the sales, the marketing, the kind of product stuff. And then we've got a, a, a finance uh, operations head okay. so, so so teams actually teams, being a teams really... i would say partnerships right because the teams are the people you hire around about you okay. and the partnerships yep. are the people in the center so okay. think about partnerships okay yep. certainly some of the research looking at survival in small companies it does seem to be founding partnerships, partnerships. Yep. do tend to have a yep. much better chance of surviving and then going on all, to grow all three of the other startups so the first one we did was two big years and that sold to facebook that was two guys out of the school of informatics the second one Nalmighty, was two two people and and then the player data was two people as well and it's always been tech market and sales so you know, that could be another one of your top tips then that's one of those. i would always make sure you've got a really good partner yeah. you know because okay. they can because it's a lonely place sometimes as a ceo right so you can take a lot of stress right so um if you've got somebody to share some of that stress with and actually what you tend to find is um the tech people are down about the tech stuff well, you're up because you're excited about the kind of some meetings or something and then so you're up and they're down and yeah. then you know you're down and they're up so, so, it's, you, you've, so got you've actually balance. got it's unusual for the both used to be down at the same time yeah. so you've got somebody to drag you along a little bit okay. so that's something that's, that's good. to think about yeah okay let's let's okay continue yeah. so um what is your commercial model so so this is we we got this really badly wrong right i mean we we got this badly wrong we mm. um we, we built a set of tools. We, we actually, took, people normally laugh at this, right? We actually took over the Power Rangers website uh, globally, which is, there was four and a half million unique users. So it was pretty big um, a month. And, um, and we, 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 we built that. And we built a whole load of tools to take their existing website out of the old platform and put them into the new one. And we did it pure as time and material. We didn't realize the value of what it was to build a website. So they, they probably got it for, you know, a quarter of the price, what they should have paid for it. So we got that wrong because we didn't, we we went for the time and material rather than the outcome. So just think about what your, your model is. And if you're building a whole load of tools to make things much, much more efficient, it's a bit like building yourself a JCB, you know, and then charging them time instead of actually for the whole, you know, if you're building, a, if somebody's building a canal, right? It's like the old days, there was loads of people with shovel and you kind of hire per person and how long it took. If you've got JCB and did it in six months, right? The cost of the canal becomes a fraction of the cost, but you've spent a whole load of money with a JCB. Right. You charge for the canal. Right. So just think about your charging model and get it right, because, you know, you know, you can actually do yourself a disservice because if you're the, people always people always I always find this a lot when I was negotiating big deals, people always knew the price of everything, and the value of nothing. Right. So if you can start to articulate the value that you bring. So one of the deals that we've just done recently, uh, the client went from 14 suppliers to three. You know, so they took away t tens of thousands, in fact, hundreds of thousands of pounds of costs by putting in a couple of suppliers because we did it as a service, you know, out of the cloud. You didn't have to do all the monitoring and all the management stuff and, you know, Vimeo for video delivery and Akamai for CDN and everything all came as a service. So you were saving lots of money. So just think about the value proposition of your commercial model when you're doing deals. Mm -hmm. It's super important because at the end of the day, your cash you get from these deals is the lifeblood of your company. So you just have to get it right. So what is your charging model? You know, are you a services company? Are you a product company? Are you a blend of both? You know, we're a blend of both, you know, so we do services and we do product. Um, but you've got to be very clear. And, and, and also uh, I've seen these contracts, you know, and I did these contracts at Microsoft that were pages and pages long. Um, in fact, that's not even, doesn't even do justice. It was binders and binders of thickness of contract. 
um, you know, a, a contract's quite simple. It's just a story of the service you're going to deliver to your customer. So just make it super simple, right? It's like, you, we'll do this for that, you know, and, and be as clear and articulate as possible. And also just make sure you set out the parameters of what that deal looks like. So just make sure you get in writing what you're responsible for and what you're not. Because sometimes when you're doing pretty complex products like we do, sometimes the customers are responsible for things. So make sure that the things that you're responsible for, you, 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 you are the person that delivers that service. So I'll give you a simple example. Uh, we were just about to do a massive launch last week and the customer was responsible for the certificates of a massive global website and the certificates expired 45 minutes before we were due to go live, right? That was their fault, not ours, right? So that didn't go against their SLAs. We were able to say, hey, guys, by the way, you do know your certificates, certificates have run out. And so that was a bit of a panic for about 25 minutes as we were getting them all sorted out again because we were doing a global launch for Windows 11. And so that had to be quickly fixed. Um, but, but, but we were not responsible for those certificates. Our service was still up and running. You know, so we have that well documented. We're responsible from that bit to that bit, and you're responsible from that bit to that bit and make it as simple as that. It's super, super important. Okay, thanks, Peter. Okay. Um, I, I, we've got some more questions coming in, but they're quite general questions that All I right. think- Do you want to go to the end then and we'll do them at the end? Is yeah, that... let's do those right, at okay, the end. keep on going, right? Because I might answer some of the questions and we don't have to ask them, right? So uh, I've just all covered this off already, right? So have very well clear defined contracts, clear boundaries, what delivery is going to be look like. Look like. Be super, super clear, and I've covered this already. Be, be super clear on the value you bring. Right. It's like you're, 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 you know, as soon as you get into a cost discussion with a customer, um, the, then it just becomes a kind of a race to the bottom. Who's going to provide the cheapest service? Right. But if you start in a proper, proper strategic discussion, a partnering discussion about we are going to make your job better. We're going to make your company more profitable. We're going to increase revenues for your organization or we're going to decrease costs for you. We're going to make you more profitable. Why do you care how much it costs? Right. It's all about value. So just make sure you understand the value that you bring and be confident with your charging model be because your customers are, right? They'll be quick enough to go and charge their customers. So just be confident what your charging model is and then be clear on your payment terms, right? As soon as somebody says to you 120 days or stuff, right? Just walk away, right? Because you, you, you're going to go bust, you know, because actually it's, it's like the old kind of rules of survival, right? You can, you can last, um, what is it? Three, three minutes without oxygen, you know? Uh, three hours without shelter, three days without food, and three weeks without water. Right? It's the same in a company, right? So if you've got if you've got um, uh, customers want 120 days or whatever they are in, in payment terms, you're going to get yourself into cash flow difficulties very very quickly. And actually, the more successful in the early days you become, the more difficult and challenging it becomes for you because the costs of the business and maintaining it become higher, quicker. So therefore, you're going to run out of money. So just be very careful. If somebody comes in. I think it's anything more than 30 days payment terms is wrong, you know, so be very, very clear. We're lucky we've got customers that pay us within three days. If they're trying to do something funny, like say, oh, we want 90 days or we want 60 days or something, we'll say, well, we'll bill you in advance, right? So bill in advance. So therefore, when you get into kind of 60 or 90 days, you, you know, you get paid three months worth of revenue on that day. And then you actually know that it's coming. So Peter, we do have a question about that. And you've partially answered it by right. saying the 30 days, uh -huh. but did you have that expectation right from the get-go, 30 days, or or has that changed as you We have got some client, we've got one, we've got a couple at 45. Okay. Right, but we bill in advance. Okay. So we bill a quarter in advance and get paid in 45 days. So that's something you've been quite clear about from, very clear from the get-go. Very clear customers, very clear. You've got to be super clear on this, right? Because it's not fair. You're not a bank, right? Why should you fund their business? Yeah. You know, okay. you've cash. Cash is the lifeblood, right? I, I, I go out of this a lot, right? It is, um, you know, revenue's vanity, profit sanity, cash flow is reality, right? It's like you, you need cash for your business. And, and you know? did, did you ever have customers that walked away because they said, no, we're not? Uh, we haven't. No, so, so you can be... Because you focus on the value. Yeah, yeah. You focus on the value to them, okay. right? And actually, one of the things that, and I speak a lot about this a lot, is, and, it, and it's an all walks of what you do, right? Because sometimes you've got to fire people, right? And it's like a bit of fairness, right? Just be fair. And mm -hmm. do you think I'm being unfair by asking for you to pay for my services in 30 days when I've got to pay them quicker than that? You know? So I think across all walks of what you do with your business, if you can actually look yourself in the mirror and say, I think I'm being fair here, I think that's reasonable. You know, we've, we've had, sorry. Yeah, you got of course. anything? Of course, yeah. 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 Yep. Do you, do you ever suggest that 
trials? So we, we, we do do proof of concepts, right? But we charge for them. Uh, we, we, charge. we charge for the proof of concept. And actually we've got big partners as well through because we use Azure. And we, we've had we've had the cost we've had Microsoft there. Microsoft have paid some of it as well, and then we put some money in as well. So we have to, done proof of concepts, but they are very focused, yeah. and they're like, "You, we prove this, you're going to give us that," and so we'll run a two month proof of concept. But we will charge the client for the proof of concept, it's a, it's a nominal fee. and a nominal fee, but it basically we wash your face. So it's just enough. And also as part of the selling process, right? <laughs> so if you can get the customer to actually pony up the money to pay for a proof of concept, validate. they've actually validate, validated the fact that they want to actually do business with you anyway. Everyone will take a free proof of concept to try and, you know, nick some ideas from you. Uh, we wouldn't entertain that. Maybe so I think that's another thing as well. Try and always appear never to be desperate, right? Just to feel like you're always in control or be re re relatively calm. But just be. I'm trying to watch the slide. This slide's just explain me here. The um the the yeah just just be very very careful uh, and 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 it's getting back to two things: value and fairness, right? You know, if you're fair with people, people will be fair with you. If you deliver value, then they're happy to pay the money. So just take a very mature view of it. And, 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 and I do understand that people can get themselves where they're really, really, really struggling. And, and you have got to be careful. You know, and, and a lot of that, one of the things I think is really important is just manage your burn rate and make sure you're, you're not losing too much money, right? Just cut your cloth accordingly. Never say, oh, I've got six months, you know, I've got six months left of money and I'm going to do this, I'm going to do that, right? Because Murphy's Law is if it's going to go wrong, it will, right? And it tends to, things tend not to happen the way you think they're going to happen. So just be very careful when it comes. And, and I think the whole thing is, is just get your value proposition right. You know, and that's something we put a lot of work in now is just make sure we can, we can actually articulate the value to our customers, what we deliver. Uh, we're still a little bit under the radar, right? We've just uh, kicked one of the market leaders out of a really large client. In fact, we've just kicked two different market leaders out of two big, large clients. So people will start to notice what we're doing quite quickly now. But we have kind of hidden under the radar for quite a bit of time now. But well, IP. I mean, I, I it's in, and this is something really interesting as well as IP. We. If you, if you start to go and get your patents and stuff, you've got to share so much of your product and it takes so long in a fast moving world that's gone by the time you even get there, right? So uh, IP is super important, right? Protect your IP with everything. And that's actually getting back to the charging models, right? If you don't charge for a piece of software or IP, then actually if, you, if it's deemed free, then you're actually kind of releasing it free into market. So you've just got to be careful about what you're building and make sure you're very clear and articulate. But if you look at the world we're in, things are moving all the time quite, quite quickly. So by the time you've got a patent for something, you're actually onto the next thing by the time you even get it. So we've not really went for patents too much, to be honest. Uh, Just Pete, now, Peter, I know that you've got lots more to, to talk to us about. But I, think, I think we've only got about 15 right. minutes. Am I right if we've got about 15 minutes? Yes, just so we can get all the questions. Yes, boss. Right. OK, so I'll go quite quick now. Right. So, so you know, offices and stuff, what they mean to you. Uh, I think it's really important in the early days not to be too flash. Uh, we've got quite nice offices, um, but we, we have big corporate clients that come to see us. But just think about what your offices are. You know, they're the face. They actually kind of instill confidence. Um, we, we, our offices are right in the middle of Edinburgh. It's right on top of Waverley's train station. So it's nice and easy for the staff to get in and out when we actually lived in the real world instead of this virtual world we're living in today. Um, but um, uh, make sure the location is easy to get to and, and that you can actually be proud of them. And we are starting to drip people back into our offices. And I'm really keen that into next year we start to, to get people back in. I think it's important for the economy and I think it's important for businesses. Um, when it comes to our offices, one of the things that we've seen stuff suffer a bit more has been the, um, has been the innovation around about the actual product build. Uh, that hasn't quite been as connected as it was when everyone was together. And we've started to bring people back in the last few months from the product team. And as soon as you get people back in the room again, everyone just gravitates to each other and the ideation and the ideas and the problems we've solved has been accelerated because people are back working together. You know, a half day and round a whiteboard can, you know, save weeks and weeks around about Zoom calls or team calls or whatever you're using. So offices are super important to you. Um, storytelling. Um, I remember when Microsoft actually, and it was a friend of mine called Steve Clayton, became the chief storyteller at Microsoft. And I was like, well, that's a good title. He's managed to pull that one off. Um, but that's really important. 
right? Um, storytelling, being able to talk articulately about what your company is and what it does and, and what you know, the DNA of the business is and actually what you're all about is super important, right? Who you are, what you are, you know? Uh, and sometimes you've got to have two different. So when I'm speaking to the market and people, it's all about, hey, we can get your stuff to market quickly. You can go global, you're going to be accessible and we can localize and we can change things in lots of languages. And then when we speak to the, C- the, C- the CIO and the chief security officers, it's like, oh my gosh, our stuff is just dull. You know, it is secure, it's scalable, it's robust, you know, it is headless, you can't hack it, right? So so that's the, the discussion. So it's like, you know, are you wow, are you safe? You can't be both, right, to the same person. But what, what we think is you can have different stories for different people. So just be very, very good. The elevator pitch, you know, everyone goes on about elevator pitch, right? And in, in the States, it's a lot easier because you can be in the elevator for like 20 minutes. But, you know, when, when you're here, you know, if you can articulate in 30 seconds what your business is, you know, to someone senior, that, that's enough to get a very good meeting. You know, if you can sit there and go, I can do X, Y, Z, you know, and save you money and do this, then, then you know, that, that is superb. And actually, one of the most important things in business is your network. So, you know, one of the things working for a big organization, and, that, and that's why I think that there's, two, there's two schools of starting a business, right? A lot of people, when they're brave and young and, you know, carefree, they can just dive in and take the risks. Or when you're, you know, one of the things that, that, that Gates used to say to us all, a lot at Microsoft was there's three phases of your career. You learn as much, you earn as much, and you leverage as much. So I think that's why so many founders come out of stage three with the leverage as much because you already have your networks. So for instance, we've just won uh, a lot of business in Motorola. The reason we won the business in Motorola is I used to work beside the guy who used to run Windows for Microsoft, the guy called Ian McDonald. Ian McDonald's are great friends. He was in a meeting in uh, Chicago with with because he was now the chief um, solution architect for Motorola. Um, and he was in a meeting and I was saying, hey, we've got some problems with our websites. And he goes, oh, my mate in Scotland's got a solution and he's just done it for Microsoft. He could do it for us get a phone call of him. And this is through COVID, right? So this isn't like we could go and meet them or anything. You know, get a phone call of him, have a chat with the CMO before you know, you know, a few months later, we're live with two massive websites for Motorola, right? We've never met them and we've just delivered two projects with the design teams in LA, the technical security teams are in Seattle, half the guys are in Chicago and then the rest of them are up in, in, um, in uh, Vancouver. So networks, you know, just make sure as part of your storytelling, leverage the networks you've got available to you. Um, and, and, and actually building the quality of collateral, this is something that we've not done a great job of up to now. You know, we're kind of a, the cobbler's bairns has no shoots. You know, our website isn't probably what it should be, but we've not been trying to sell too much. So we've got a kind of functional website, but when we, we've, we've now got UX people working for us, uh, going into the next phase, we'll have some very good websites. So, you know, um, it's a bit like building a product. It takes longer than you think it's going to take. Mm-hmm. Um, Staff culture, uh, we'll go quite quick just now. I think we've only got a few minutes to get looked at. So um, uh, just make sure you hire the best you can afford. Um, we, we tend to interview, uh, one is for, um, for technology, t- technological skills. So we test them. So we run tests for people. Uh, one is, um, do we think that there'll be a cultural fit for our organization? Um, and and the, the third is just, uh, you know, Let's see if we actually like each other, you know, and they're, they're interviewed by three different people. So we tend to do, you know, a technical interview, stroke test, a cultural fit, and then actually do we really like each other and do we think they're right for the organization? Because, you know, it's, it's, it's really great to run and hire loads of people, but it's horrible when you've got to fire them if they don't fit in. So, you know, I'm a great believer in um, hire slow, fire fast. If someone doesn't fit in, just get them out as soon as you can. Um, and, and I mean, just get them out because you're not doing them a favor and you're not doing yourself a favor. So just make sure, and we, l- let me put things in perspective, right? We've done it like four times in seven years. So it's not like we're a kind of, we don't hire a lot. We don't fire very many people at all. You know, um, it's, it's a bad thing to do, but you can, you can quantify the success of your hiring and your firing and also the people that leave. So, so you, you always need a bit of attrition because some people aren't right. But we try to keep, we try to hire right, and then we hold on to people for as long as we can. So make sure you put put great packages around about it, and don't just think about salaries. Right when you're starting a business, so we give all the people that we in the business shares. Everyone's got private medicine. Everyone's got whole life critical cover. You know, just make sure you put a package together to make them want to stay working for you for a long time because your staff is your most important asset, um, along with your product. That the staff are the people that make the product. So really, ultimately, the staff are the most important. So just make sure, and, and I, I don't like having too many contractors. I tend to like making sure I've got full-time staff. Contractors are good for short-term things. We don't have the skills, bring them in, get the stuff you want out of them and then kick them out the door as quickly as you can. 
Okay, so one of the things, staff and culture as well, if you're building a business, being entrepreneurial from day one, start, like, you know, if you want to, uh, you know, people used to say, oh, dress for the job you want, not the job you have, right? So this is kind of like that. So, you know, work like a big company, start having finance meetings, sales meetings, just product meetings, market meetings, management meetings. So even if our sales meetings is, oh, we've actually not really done anything too much, but we've went from here to here, but just get your sit, yourself fit for sale. So we kind of use the old model of, you know, 20%, 40%, 60%, 80%, you know, through the closing cycle and then have a pipeline. So pipeline management. So we've got our systems and everything in place. So once we want to go to have 50, 60 clients, we'll use the sales sales process that we're using now because we've got everything in place. The same with the finance. So we've got all our systems ready for enterprise readiness. So just think when you're running a business to actually act like a big company and have these functions in place and have people responsible for them. They might even be responsible for two. So they may be responsible for finance and sales. And actually they may be responsible for three because they might have HR as well. And I didn't put that on the list. But just make sure you've got the right, the right people in place. Um, so think big, aim high. You know, a lot of innovation has got to come from small companies and people don't understand this, right? So if I was to try and start a business we've started 15 years ago, pre-cloud, mm -hmm. I would have needed an extra 50 million to have the infrastructure. You know, so if you think about what you've got today available to you at your fingertips, you've got unlimited resource when it comes to technology and IT, you know, for not a lot of cash. And you don't need to build big infrastructure, you know, projects. And all you do is you just get a subscription for, you know, either Google or AWS or Microsoft Cloud. And you've got unlimited access to resources for not a lot of cash. So, you know, you can actually um, go and think globally. You can actually build something new if you analyze the market properly. And then a lot of innovation has got to come from small companies because big companies have got a legacy and it's very difficult within big organizations to cannibalize existing businesses. You know, so if you, you know, Apple came out with the iPad, Microsoft had a tablet way before Apple had one, but because, um, because of Windows and Office and it was all centered around the PC, Microsoft wasn't as focused on a tablet as it was the PC. Mm. So therefore innovation comes from disruptors. So people have got small companies, you go and do big things. So, you know, and that gets on to kind of tenacity and confidence. You know, what the biggest result, I think the number one thing you need to be a founder or a startup is tenacity. Just keep on going, right? So human nature always dictates the status quo easier. You know, the status quo is like kind of easier than change, right? But actually to decide not to change is to make a decision. And actually the decision to do nothing is probably more drastic than to do something. Right. So if you're on fire and you're next to a swimming pool, but you can't swim, I take my chances and jump in. Right. So it's like that. That's the kind of things. Don't let negative people derail you. I absolutely hate people who are sappers and they suck the life out of you. Right. So just make sure you surround yourself with positive people, you know, who can do. And um, if anyone ever tells you your idea is stupid or, you know, it's, it, you know, they don't think it's a good idea or X, Y, and Z, that's your problem, not theirs. Right. So actually make sure you're very, very good at articulating your solution or product or what your being is. Um, and then the kind of summary, and I'm back to the kind of the crawl, walk, run. So um, make sure you spend a lot of time getting it right, define, design, build and test. And actually the design and define phases, you can just do with two people, you know, and it's not costing you anything. So, you know, when you get into this build and test, you're starting to lose money. So just make sure your proposition and that what you're going to build is as well thought through and you can get all the charging models and everything all kind of laid down as a kind of blueprint before you actually send, spend proper cash. So just think about once you, once you actually take that trip and actually start your company, getting it going, hiring staff and everything, do as much as you can. It doesn't cost you money before you get into that phase and then just get yourself ready to go. So that's it. Crawl, walk, run. And I think that is me finished. Brilliant, Peter. Thank you very, very much. Um, we, we'll, we'll give a round of applause just now, but we do have some questions oh, as well. Thank you. Um, okay, Peter, this first question um, is, is quite detailed. So let me just talk it, talk it through here. Okay. It's I done, don't do detail, right? So just, just Well, me, me neither, <laughs> but I'm, I, so it, it, but I, can, I can do it. I can, right. I can do it. I can do it. Right. Um, Danielle's saying, uh, I thought I was old for a tech entrepreneur. I've just discovered that I am nine years below the average age. So well that's, done. that's it. Well yeah. done. Um, I'm starting a tech spin out here at Strathclyde Uni, um, hopefully setting up the company next year. Peter, do you have any advice on how to engage with customers early on that journey? During your crawl develop, product development stage, 
We have exactly the same proposition that you had at the beginning, proposing a service early on to build our product at the same time. How did you find the customer response at that stage? And did right. your target change after that? Yeah, this is good. That's a good question, actually. So this is this is getting back to using your network, you know, so using your mates that you've you've worked with over the years and actually sitting down and talking it through with them. So we we have changed a lot uh, our proposition once we started. So our, our whole idea was not to build an actual CMS to build websites and run them. Uh, our whole idea was to build the runtime and then integrate all of the existing websites in market already okay. and actually take them onto the cloud. And what we found very quickly when, when we were going through that process was that they weren't cloud ready and they said they had connectors that just didn't work. So we actually got to the point where we actually said, well, I'd always said we'll never build a CMS because we don't need to because there's so many in market. Mm -hmm. And then we got to the point where we said, Do you know what? It's 18 months worth of work. Let's just go, go and build it ourselves. Okay. So we, we have changed our proposition. Um, and the other thing is um, we, we got ourselves to a certain point with what we knew. And then once we could afford it, we went external and we brought in a company called Nile HQ, which are based in Edinburgh, which are very good at customer experience, uh, customer centric okay. type feedback. So we ran 25 user roundtables with customers whereby they fed back what they wanted in, okay. in the product moving forward. So we actually brought external in to help with the kind of more customer centric view. So we did, we, once we could afford it, we actually brought people in to help us with the customer feedback. But, but, the, but the first part of the question is just use your network and go and speak to some friendly people you know in that job function role uh, or who know about this stuff and go and ask them and just get, get people like sharing their, people like showing off, right, and what they know. So <laughs> go, and, go and get, go and tap their brains. So good advice for Daniela, yeah, thank you. Um, James has had, asked a question here. Do you agree that a proper budget for training and adoption is vital to ensuring longevity with the customer? Absolutely. So, so um, if you look at, and actually, it's quite interesting. If you don't put enough effort into the training, you actually put the pressure onto your help desks and your internal teams that actually support customers. So the more you can do to write really good documentation, and, and actually, if you think about the way tech is now, you can actually just do little videos that are pretty cheap. You can actually make them yourself mm -hmm. and just make nice little videos to explain how to do things, how the functions work, how to actually, so for instance, you know, with our system, it's all about building components to begin with. So we've got, you know, little kind of tutorials on how to okay. build a component. And, and yeah, so so training is something, uh, I don't know if I think I had it in there somewhere, but, you know, training is something super important. The usability of your system is important. So you've got to make it, and it's going to sound really bad, right? But see if you just, just assume that everyone knows nothing. Yeah, you know, uh -huh, yeah. Right? And, and actually make it as simple, stupid mm -hmm. as possible. Yeah, I saw that you had that up on your right. slide. Yeah. So make things as simple as possible because one of the mistakes we made was we, we assumed that a lot of the content delivery people were actually developers mm -hmm. and they're, they're more graphic designers than they so are developers. So they're using different language. So or... different, different language. So we, we built our first versions around about GitHub, branch and merge and type technology type uh -huh. discussion instead of more um, workplace workbook type okay. just so the language was wrong as well okay. so we fixed that now but that's something that's part of the crawl walk run we actually learned from the customer engagement we made things a little bit too technical and we we didn't fully understand exactly so that's good learning then. it's good learning, good we, learning. We, we i wish i'd known that before we started right yeah and so. um, there's a few more questions here but i think there were a couple of people in the audience wendy right. wendy Hi, Peter. Um, yeah, my question is sort of specifically around the, the scale up um, right. proposition around SMEs and where you can get good, what your advice would be in, in sourcing and finding good financial investor partners and what that looks like. Because when you said, you know, if they're not wanting your, your P&L and all the rest of it, how do you give them the information to decide whether you want to give them a million 10%, 1.5, right. how do you work that? And, and how would you take two in the same race to make sure if one did, didn't yeah. become? Yeah, I'm not the best at this because I've been a bit kind of, we've just tried to do it mainly to ourselves. I think what, what, what everyone should do is a good, um, like an investment pack, you know, and, and actually share that. So if you decide to take money, actually go to many people, but there's actually some good advisory firms to go to as well. And maybe it's worth speaking to them. Um, I, I don't know what the right answer is to this necessarily all the time because it's there's so many people out there. I mean, Karen, you, you've maybe got some views at Scotland IS. 
because you you see that across your member membership but um, Karen's the CEO of Scotland uh, is or Scotland IS if you're the old money um <laughs> And I think that is just a general problem is yeah. what is the best deal for you? Yeah. Who's the best investors to go to? And I think, yeah. as Peter said, there's no right answer. There's no one size fits all. Um, and I think the community, it's, it's making sure that you have that network in that community and, and you can actually, sense check some of this yeah, stuff with. And, and actually, that, that's something I've not touched on is we built a really good board, right? So that's where you actually start to build a board roundabout. So, for instance, I've got the guy who was the CEO of Archangel, on my board so he knows investment very very well i've got the, so what, what we've got on our board is um we've got two lawyers two accountants two techies and two sales marketing people on our board so we've got a real blend so we've got the person who was the formal chief counsel for skyscanner on our board so obviously she knows the investment portfolio very well so that that's something i didn't actually touch on on the presentation is build a really good board yeah. to help um, advise the management team and um, so so Finding people like John, John, who's on my board to help uh, navigate when they know where the investors sit and what they do and what they specialize in, what they like. Uh, I, I came, I worked in the States for a long time. I was, I was in Seattle with, with Microsoft for nine years and, and was kind of part of an MA group. Uh, I, I saw the, 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 the investors in the States were very more on how do we help you grow and, and make you massive, whereas here it's more about how much can we get of the company at the start. You know, so it's it is very much. You, you, good, there's very, good, sorry, yeah. there's many, no, many different good, models. Sorry yeah. about that. Good we, question. We can connect if you want to have a chat yeah. about it. I, yeah. I'm going to bring Phil in here because yep. your comments about boards, I think, are quite quite relevant. Phil, if you want to say a few words. Yeah. No. Absolutely. And it, it's um, uh, when you were talking about the profile of investors mm -hmm. that I, I I was thinking to myself, it's the same process for your board as well that it's making sure that the right people are there for the right reasons mm -hmm. and so that you have the right skill sets. We're doing work just now on profiling skills of boards right. and kind of trying to help them to identify what skills they've got, what skills gaps there are. And again, for that kind of thing, there are some really good and there are actually some really inexpensive tools. So yeah. one of our visiting professors Charlotte has launched her own tool for um, examining the impact, the kind of efficiency, right. the skill set, etc. And she's got it on its open source. Right. Um, and again, where, yeah. where obviously the, the, the money's made in it is you, you can go through the tool and you get a report there, but actually it's then working with kind of experts that can say that they can help you to kind of make sense of it. So that 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 really resonated. Yeah. Uh, and I thought well, it's very similar. And you see boards who you know, famously boards like Theranos, where they had yeah. kind of you know, pretty much every heavyweight politician in the States um, asking the wrong questions uh, and in it mm -hmm. for the wrong reasons. As a CEO, you've got to decide what you want the board to be, right? So do you want it to be a compliance board to make sure you know they're 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 marking your homework, or do you want an advisory board? which is to help you grow your business, right? I think that when you're a startup or a scale up, you want an advisory board to help you grow your business. And then once you go and become a public company, you need a compliance board to keep you out of jail, right? So I think that's the, I think that's the way to think about it. No, absolutely. At, at, at different stages yeah. of the business. And the coming in and out, right? Yeah. You, you know, it's a bit like a kind of rocket going to the moon, right? The thrust is to take you through the first stage. Don't go anywhere after that, right? So it's different horses for courses. Yeah. Okay, guys, um, we've, we're actually starting to get lots more questions. We're not going to have time to answer oh. them all. But what we will do is you, we can have a follow up and we can share the questions. Yeah, and put my Strathclyde email address and just chuck them out. And we can, do, and, and we, we can make um, Peter's responses um, available alongside the recording of this. I suddenly have gone really loud. So. I apologise for that. Um, Peter, thank you so much. Lots and lots of learning in that. Um, a lot to, to unpack. Um, tenacity, clearly very, very important. The power and the importance of your network, also really important. Um, I love the, comp the, the analogy that you used as well is very, very helpful, I think, for us. And also some of the broader issues that you touched upon, um, things like getting more women into STEM as well and the work that, that you're doing around that. And it's fantastic to hear the graduates that you've had and how how well they've they've done. Mm -hmm. um, 
we are now taking Peter to speak with some of our entrepreneurs. I don't know if that's happening in this room or is that happening elsewhere in here? Lovely. OK. But uh, for those of you who joined us online, thank you very much. Um, we hope you've enjoyed the, the this afternoon. The recording will be available, Sarah, in about a week's time. Thank, thank you, Peter. Thank you.